there's far more rewards out there than there is work to do. And there's a lot of work to do. Jesus runs into a problem and then he comes up with a solution. Well, here we are in Matthew chapter 9, 34. We're at the end of that as we move into chapter 10. And we're talking here about where Jesus is going through all the towns and villages and he's doing all of the ministry that he can do. And he ends up being exhausted at the end of it and realizing in his human point of view, just how great the need is. And he exclaims to his disciples, how, how great is the harvest, but yet how few are the workers. And then after that, this is when he formally organizes his 12 apostles to be able to send them out into the harvest field and then for them to replicate that and to do that again. And so we'll talk about the organizational structure here in just a moment, but I want to dive into the scripture here first so that you can understand exactly what we are talking about. So chapter 9, verse 34, on to chapter 10, verse 4, uh, this is what it says. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, for they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. He then said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus called his twelve disciples, and he gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First is Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot. Who betrayed him. So the first thing that jumps out at us is we uh, make the observations first out of these scriptures and then teach according to this verse by verse, is Jesus continuing his mission of telling people the kingdom is near to repent and then he heals them. This is the same uh, recipe that he has been uh, doing up until this point. It is the kingdom of heaven is near, he tells people to repent, and then he heals them. And, uh, and so as that happens, this is also what we'll learn next week in Jesus' speech to which he gives his disciples when he sends them out is to tell them to go in that like manner, is that we are to tell people the kingdom is near. You know, we need to realize that there's far more ahead of us than there is behind us. And there's far more in eternity than there is now. Jesus talks about the, the in the next chapter that we're going to get to next week, about the, uh, the black and white of what is the end, what's going to happen when judgment comes. And it's going to be really serious. So he wants his disciples to go out and to warn people to do this. You know, there's so many people that just don't know about God or have wrong um, conceptions of God to which we need to clarify. And we need to be able to go out and to basically harvest the whole world. And so he sees this massive need as he continues to do his ministry. He's just from a human point of view, completely overwhelmed at the need. He's seeing the people are harassed and helpless. And this also testifies to the bankruptcy of their leadership that they had. And the whole point of leadership is to help people to get to where they otherwise would not be able to go. But it does imply doing it doesn't imply doing everything for the person. You know, this is why we say that good governance, and when it comes to even our own civil society, is not that the government does everything for somebody, because that society will quickly collapse. But what it is is to help to protect and guide the people so that they can make good decisions, so they can have a, a proper playing field, as it were, to be able to look after themselves and their families. And, uh, and this is what is not happening in this point in time. We already learned from Matthew, the tax collector, that uh, Herod Antipas is someone who just liked to collect taxes. He was the chief tax collector. So this allowed, um, you know, taking uh, exorbitant amounts of funds from the people also harass them because they're working for somebody else. Next, we see that there's a, a moral bankruptcy in the uh, religious aristocracy. You know, if they couldn't even see Jesus, their Messiah, when he came, how bankrupt was their uh, religion, how bankrupt was their their spirit, and that their hearts were indeed far from God. So they weren't leading and guiding or protecting people. The people are just used by the leaders, whether it be civil leaders or religious leaders. Whereas Jesus teaches later on that uh, the greatest among you will be the servant of all. And he calls leaders to be people to pour themselves out to help guide and protect people so they can reach all their uh, potential, you know, both in the spirit and to reach their potential in, in this world. Uh, all for good, of course. And so as we kind of consider that, we need to realize that there is a leadership structure here. There's a leadership vacuum that has re uh, that is related to Jesus recognizing that all these people are harassed, they're helpless, they're completely on their own and abandoned by good leadership. And so now they're falling prey to the, the difficulties that are around them. And now Jesus' solution to that is to come up with an organized religion. Now, some people hate that phrase, and I think it's been overused to the point that I think I can bring it back up is no, what people dislike 
uh, about religion isn't as organized. They don't like the religion that Jesus actually had to face, which is where the leaders were about themselves and used people as pawns for their own well-being. This is usually what the phrase of, I don't like organized religion. When people say that, they say that mean, usually means everything rises to the top. There's no accountability in leadership, and we're just left to our own devices. That's actually not organized religion. When people say they don't like organized religion, what they're saying is they don't like disorganized, immoral religion. Uh, Jesus organizes. He organizes in a similar way to Moses. If you recall that when um, Moses was overwhelmed with the great need of all the people, that he was the only judge and everybody was standing all day long waiting to hear their case before Moses, it was his father-in-law that came along and said, it was Jethro, said, Moses, you're going to weigh yourself out and you're going to tick off everybody because they're not going to be able to you know, get justice today. So why don't you find 10 people under you and get 10 people under them and kind of fan out that way and organize in a way that everybody can get justice. If some of your uh, lesser judges, they can deal with the uh, non-difficult matters. And once, if it gets too tough, and go up to the next level. And if it gets too tough for even them, get them to bring it to you. And then you can handle only the difficult uh, sessions. And then everybody will go home and have justice and then everybody will be happy. And so that is just a normal uh, way of scaling up. If you get busy with something, you need to delegate. And this is exactly what Jesus is doing. He recognizes this and he tells his disciples, like, guys, this is a huge, huge harvest. There's more work than even one man, one God man even, to do. And so he organizes his 12 to be able to send them out and to have a special authority. The next thing is too here is that Jesus is actually fulfilling a prophecy out of Jeremiah where there was lots of false prophets in that day. And God prophesied through Jeremiah that God was going to send shepherds after his own heart. Not the shepherds that even Jeremiah faced that was this disorganized immoral religion that we were talking about. So even in Jeremiah's day, he was dealing with people who used leadership as a way uh, to benefit themselves instead of to be able to help others. Now there is great rewards in being a leader, but you just don't get them from the people who you're serving. God will reward us on that special day for those who jump into the game, who respond to the need of the harvest and, uh, and work towards that end. And so next it also says that Jesus, that should be a big part of our prayer life is to ask therefore the Lord of the harvest to send workers into his field. And this is why we have uh, leadership in churches. It's why we have ordination where we pray that God would bring people to be able to lead us. And then we lay hands on them and we ordain people into ministry. And uh, we believe in the priesthood of all believers. Everybody has equal access to God, but there's a certain amount of uh, people who will be involved from a leadership point of view. People wouldn't need to be led if there was no gift of leadership. The fact that Jesus says there's a gift of leadership in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans chapter 12 uh, tells us that people still do need to be led and there's a certain amount of people that are leaders. And so this tells us two things. Uh, you should be paying attention to see if the Lord doesn't maybe has you on a leadership track. Maybe you're already a leader and just uh, haven't had the opportunity to serve. Or maybe you think you might be a leader, but you still need some more training. Uh, we need to get you on a track. The church always needs to be looking, because if we're praying for workers to go out into the harvest field, leaders need to be looking for other leaders. And we need to be giving other junior leaders an opportunity to be able to flex their muscles, as it were, and leadership to help them to get there. It should be one of the number one aspects of the church is to continue to raise leaders. And this also tells that at times, um, uh, where I wasn't a leader in the church, I knew one thing, is find a good leader and then follow them. Make their, their effort a joy and help their leadership succeed. And that's exactly what I found later was actually in scripture, is that we're supposed to follow good leadership. When we recognize somebody who we, who we follow, when we recognize somebody who is doing a good leading job, and uh, if I'm not called into leadership, then I just simply need to put my efforts in to help that person, to help their work go further. And then I'll get rewarded along with them. Which we're gonna learn next week, that is exactly what happens. People who support leaders or missionaries or whoever that may be, gets the same reward as those who are actually out there doing it. So if you've ever sent funds towards some missionary and they have brought thousands of people on other continents to the faith, that's going to be credited to your account. So we have to understand that the rewards that we get for the work that we do far surpass any of the work or sacrifice that we do in this world. Now, be, I wanna be careful here because I don't wanna bait anybody into leadership based upon what they get out of life. But I would be uh, in abandonment of scripture if I didn't teach you that there are incredible blessings and eternal rewards that far away any difficulty that we could ever face here on the earth. And you need to know that. That's gonna comfort you and that's gonna give you the encouragement maybe when you wanna give up or maybe when you think that, that when the going gets tough that it's like, Lord, why did you abandon me in this? Why is this so difficult? 
uh, is to realize that no, if people reject you, it's because they reject Christ. And he will reward us for any difficulty we face because of him. And it's going to be a very, very large reward. Uh, so I would be remiss if I did not teach you that. So again, a big part of what we do is to be praying for the leaders to raise up into the church, to go out into the harvest field, and to, uh, to reap a harvest. And so if you think you might have the gift of leadership, or if you think you're praying and God's calling you to, uh, on that journey, let me know. I will help you to get to where you need to go. We don't see leadership in the church as restrictive or for our own benefit, is we need to continue to bring people in. I've known some organizations that try to keep leadership as like its own little club, and uh, but that is not what the Church of Christ is supposed to be about. We are supposed to be praying for the Lord of the Harvest to send workers into the field, and that requires leadership. Jesus brings out 12 apostles to be able to get that cycle going, and they've continued. Thousands of miles later, uh, across the seas, and thousands of years later, here we are because they did do that. What is also interesting is before I get off onto apostles and organizational structure, I want to talk to you about the, the opportunity that we have before us. So remember where I just mentioned about um, that there's plenty of rewards more than the work that is out there? I want you to know that we live in such a privileged time in history, not just because it's a rich society that we live in. Like the middle class has never been this good ever. The fact that we have what we have is I could get a whole sermon on how much better our life is than just about any other time in history. And uh, But what's also interesting is we have far more people on this planet than has ever been at one person's time. Consider this. Even if Matthew, being a tax collector, good at counting, if he could have gotten involved with censuses of the Roman Empire, he would have known that there was only about 50 million people alive on the earth at that particular time. Now, of course, he wouldn't realize how many aboriginals were here in North America, South America, or those in the subcontinent of India, or China even, which still would have had less than 300 million people at his time. That's less than the size of the United States. And yet there's 8 billion people on the planet today. We talk about Matthew in his book calling him the evangelist because he's letting us know that the Messiah has come and he's explaining it in great detail and how we could become leaders and how we can become good disciples. And yet, could you imagine going back and talking to Matthew and saying, by the way, in 2,000 years, there's going to be 8 billion people on the planet. I'm thinking he would kind of freak out. He'd be like, wow, what a great opportunity. Is, is it amazing that we live in a particular generation that can bring more people to heaven than every other generation probably even combined? I don't know about you, but I think that's absolutely bonkers that we have the opportunity uh, to save. And we have the resources to be able to do it. Look at the resources we have. Uh, so we don't like, we think we get to invest into the kingdom. And here with this, this is why we love to record this as well, so that we can send this out. People around the world are learning uh, English as more than any other language. And so people who are previously unreached can find simple broadcasts like this so that they can learn about who Jesus is and that he can save them, he can heal them, and he can spend forever uh, with them in heaven. Again, I think that I, I, we should get worked up about this in a good way. Eight billion people. Even when I was born, there was four billion more people on the world now than there was when I was born. And even like a hundred years before that, there was only like one billion people on the earth. Uh, and then it kind of trickles down after that. And the way that we can communicate instantly around the world this gospel message like, praise be to the Lord that we live in this time and generation that, that way more people can come to faith in one year than ever existed in Matthew's day. Um, again, I, I don't know about you, and I, I hope you find that mind-boggling, because, as you can tell, I sure do. So here's where I would say the same thing as Jesus said. The harvest is plentiful, but yet the workers are still few. Jesus promised us that the, um, that the harvest would be plentiful. What was a harvest in those days? The harvest was your wage. It was how you made money. It was you spent everything in all year to get that so you could sell it. And so it's like those who go out into the harvest field are going to be laborers in the kingdom. This is why I say there's going to be far more rewards than what the difficulty is. The same way as farmers go out and they reap their fields. And if any of you know the phrase, make hay while the sun shines, many people from, uh, that are older than me used to have to spend their summers on farms baling hay and throwing hay. And you know what happens if any, you talk to anybody who's older than 45 and ask them if they've ever thrown a, a hay bale. And they will tell you about the dog days of the end of summer where they had to gather it all up into the barn. And they'd say, man, that's where I learned how to work. And that work sure was tough. But that was the harvest. The harvest is hard work. But the benefits are absolutely incredible to sustain us into the future. And so the harvest that we have before us today is indeed plentiful. Let's continue. We need to be, because of that, churches need to be 
leader producing factories and disciple producing factories in a way unseen in the history of the world. The demand that it is on, upon us to be able to meet the, uh, the harvest that is in front of us is something we can't look at yesteryear's methods to be able to do. And uh, we can look and get inspired by it, but we've got to take this same old gospel message and we've got to make sure that we are speeding up the way that we are producing disciples and are producing leaders. So I encourage you to, uh, to jump into the game if you've been kind of maybe sitting idle in your faith. Is uh, we, we want to use you, the Lord wants to use you, and we can do this together and the harvest is going to be incredible. So that's the exciting side of it. Part of the, maybe some of the negative side of it, this is kind of like my 3 a.m. thoughts when I'm thinking about this verse, is that one day we're going to be judged. Now, if you believe in the Lord, you're going to go to heaven. That's just the way that it is. It's like, it is our, where we put our faith is where we end up. We reject God, we reject his heaven. Uh, we accept him, we get it. But we'll be rewarded in heaven based upon how faithful we were uh, while we lived on the earth. And I can't help but think of um, the disappointment many are going to have that God's going to look at somebody I'm sure, and say, I placed you in the biggest harvest in human history, and you, and you didn't live up to it. Uh, man, I would, I would hate that to be said of me. If I, that's not what I want to hear. I want to hear good and faithful, well done, good and faithful servant, if I don't know about you. But I would not want to be going to heaven and thinking like, you know what, all the blessings that God has given me, I've just used them for my own life, uh, for my own enjoyment. And while the harvest was plentiful out there, uh, I didn't do anything about it. I think that would be the most pitiful uh, entrance into heaven that I can that I can imagine. And so I really do want to encourage you. You don't have to get, like you have to give your whole heart to the Lord, and you have to pray about the resources that you give your your time, talent, and treasure. We're never going to guilt anybody into giving. In fact, we want people to only cheerfully give because they get to be a part of God's kingdom, and not because I, I believe that God will. If you, we have to resort to, and I've seen many televangelists resort to manipulation to try to get people to give to their I don't want any of that. If you don't give because you don't love to give, then you know what? I don't think that God's going to bless what that money would do anyway, and uh, or that time or the resources that you give. We need to be with pure hearts, pouring into God's kingdom, and with the resources he gives us, we believe that this will be what he helps us to do the work he has allotted for us. So moving into the first four verses of chapter 10, we have that Jesus calls his disciples. We don't need to name them. They're an eclectic group of people. As I've mentioned in weeks past, it is really amazing. Like if you were a religious leader of that day and you saw this famous Jesus picking his disciples, you'd scratch your head and say, like, why don't you pick the cream from the crop? We've got like this seminary over here, which we have like the best young disciples coming out that you should probably pick them. But instead you got some fishermen, a tax collector mixed with a zealot. Like that's like putting a cat and a dog in a, in a big bag and tying it up and seeing what they do to each other. And it's amazing the people that Jesus was able to bring together to be able to be his leaders in his church. And, uh, and I just, I really do think that's wild. I mean, I don't think you really realize how nuts it was for Jesus to put a tax collector seen as a high treason person uh, against, like they were seen as against Israel with a zealot who was completely against Rome. Like you couldn't get polar opposite type of people. And they became friends and co-workers in the kingdom. And uh, I just think that's, that's wild who he picked. And, that would, and it's amazing. Again, it shows that when we have good leadership, good leadership can bring a great differences in people together. And great leadership points to a particular direction. And this is what Jesus starts out with. He says what he's doing. He teaches his disciples, look, I'm going to give you authority. I'm going to send you out, and you're going to tell people the kingdom is near. You're going to tell them to repent, to turn from their ways, and turn to God's. And then you're going to heal them. You're going to help them fix the problems, give them good leadership, and to help them to solve the issues that are harassing them today. That's what God wants in good leadership, is that we are problem solvers, and that we are leaders. And that first and foremost, we help people to realize, you know what? Our time on earth is nothing but a vapor, as the Old Testament teaches us. Here today and gone tomorrow as uh, we learn elsewhere. And so we need to realize the kingdom of heaven is near. Whether or not it's a long time before Jesus comes back or not, well, we all, within 100 years, will be meeting him face to face, uh, whether he comes back or our death. And that is really important for us to realize the kingdom of heaven is near. And the great part is, is we actually know the kingdom is here because Christ is with us. We know it's not in its full fulfillment yet uh, until we get to heaven, but we know now the king is with us and he has given us authority to go out. See, that's important too. You need to realize that the Christian does indeed have authority. We have authority to be able to pray. We have authority to be able to preach. 
And if people respond to us or not, it's not us that they are responding or not responding to. So this is why there's no room for holier than thou or aren't I great. It's like, you know, if God does something good in a Christian, we just say simply, thanks be to the Lord. I couldn't do anything lest he enable me. And, uh, and if somebody rejects you because of the Lord, you can just say, you know what? Uh, you're not rejecting me. You're rejecting the words of the Lord because we are ambassadors of Christ is what it comes down to. And an ambassador doesn't work on their own accord. An ambassador is a, in this world, is a representative of the government of the country that they come from. And so they don't get to go there and they get to use their skills, uh, but it is in tandem with the direction that comes from where they go. They can't just go and arbitrarily come up with a new foreign policy on their own. And so if they go and are trying to help settle a dispute in another country, if that person rejects the terms that are offered, they don't reject our ambassador. They reject the government that sent the ambassador. So in the same way, we don't need to let our hearts get pricked in a hard way when somebody rejects us because we are Christian. or that, uh, And we also shouldn't get uh, uh, confident in ourselves when something good happens. We should always remain humble and reliant on the Lord because we are just simply his ambassadors. Yes, we get to use our skills, but it has to align with the mission that he gave us. So finally, let's talk about what the word apostle means here. You know, I've seen people use and misuse the word apostle around the world uh, my entire Christian life. Uh, the word apostle itself is a very broad term. It just simply means a messenger or a sent one. This is often why we can call missionaries apostles. You know, the apostle Paul, when he is writing about the apostles, the 12 disciples, he refers to them in a more formal manner. So it can mean a, a formal, why I like to call a capital A apostle versus a small a apostle. That doesn't exist in scripture, <laughs> but this is just a way of explaining it. And uh, the same way that you can say, you know, uh, moms and dads are teachers of the kids. And then you can say that, well, you know what, then there's, you know, teachers at school. Then you can say there's teachers or professors at university. Or you can say there's teachers of the law and law school. Uh, it's really important for us to realize that it, the same way as an apostle can be broad, it can also be very narrow. The same way as having like a primary teacher or the department head of education, uh, for example. So in this regard, we would say that the 12 apostles are very much official, very much more than just the word sent or messengers, but they are the 12 leaders to which uh, Christ has to use to bring in the new wine into the new wineskin, as we talked about last week. See, remember this, when Jesus said he's doing something new, he's doing it on a different format in a way that they wouldn't understand and it would be incompatible with the faithless uh, religion that they had uh, already set up at that day. So Jesus was not going to work with the establishment, and he said that crystal clear. He's doing a new thing. And the fact that he's doing it new, but it still is fulfilling the old, not getting rid of it, but fulfilling the old covenant. And then he also fulfills that covenant again by, well, how did things start? Jacob and his 12 sons with the 12 tribes of Israel. And then Jesus is starting over with a new covenant with uh, the 12 apostles. You know, this is really important. Can you consider that even in Jesus' day, everyone there knew who their patriarch was from like 1800 years earlier? That'd be like us knowing which apostle did the faith come down to us. And then we say that we're of the tribe of Matthew or uh, the, the tribe of Paul or the tribe of Bartholomew. That'd be pretty neat, wouldn't it? Having a spiritual family tree, not just, a, you know, the genetic one. And so Jesus is starting something new, a new wine and a new wine skin. And the 12 apostles are that new wine skin. And they are the leaders that he commissions to go out. And they do. They're the ones who write down all what Jesus said and gives us this New Testament that we have. And that uh, they went on to lead and to teach and they uh, all reproduced themselves. So when it was their turn to all die for their faith, then uh, it was able, the, the Christian movement continued to go on and it flourished because they were good at making disciples. They had paid attention to Jesus saying, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Pray about this uh, very intently and do something about it. So here's my solution to the problem. Let us organize in a new way, in a pure way, where leaders are not there to just to glean from everybody else, but to help them to protect them and to guide them, to help them to get to where they need to go so that we can all together complete this gospel mission. And so other places in the New Testament where different people are called apostles does not necessarily mean that they were top leaders in the church, but just simply other missionaries out at work getting the job done. So let us be careful students of the scriptures and let us continue to boldly uh, proclaim the gospel and let us stick to the message. This is what Jesus was telling them. This, uh, we learn later, Paul says, don't get caught up in quarrels and controversies and genealogies. It's really amazing how much people can get off track and how much we are tempted to get off track. Remember, Jesus kept saying, the kingdom is coming, repent, follow me, and heal them. That's what we need to, to be about. This is why we say we stick to our core doctrine. 
too many churches out there, too many Christians get squabbling about minor doctrine that doesn't have an effect on, uh, yes, we do need to have debates and we do need to test our theologies. But ultimately, we know very clearly what are the majors in Scripture, what he wants us to do, how he wants us to act, and how we can do ministry. And we know what is clearly taught in Scripture in multiple places, and we have many examples of those teachings. When we take those teachings and put them into practice, then we will be uh, a well-oiled machine. I can't tell you even now, I see people that have an online audience, and all they can talk about is why this denomination is better than the other one. And it's like, are they on the gospel or aren't they? Do they have a proper gospel or don't they? That would be about the only thing that I would get at. Whether they think that the body and blood of Christ is truly present in the Eucharist or is it just symbolic, uh, that's not something that I would you know, waste my breath online to teach you here today, to get division amongst Christians on that. And it's like, study it, make your decision, and go for it. But let's stick on to Christ. Let's not use our breath just to try to complain against one. Like, who do you think you're winning when you complain against another Christian online? I don't, I don't know about you, but like, there's so many people. I guess I get a bit riled up about it because I look back through history and find that there are more people arguing about which denomination was correct when I was an atheist and I walked by five churches to go to school. And not one of them had a door open or a person available to talk to me, someone who was far from God. And yet I find out later that most Christians then only talked about why this one was better than that one, when yet lost me was out there. So I do get a little bit riled up about that one. I don't like seeing Christians argue with each other over pointless, fruitless things. Again, yes, you need to learn good doctrine. The more up in leadership you go, yes, you got to test some of these things. But don't ever let it uh, make you slander some other Christian. And don't ever let it keep you off the goal of letting people know about Jesus Christ. And again, if there's those that don't know that Jesus Christ even exists, and then there's those that do but have severe misconceptions that have pulled them out of the faith. You could be a teacher or a leader just to the people around you when you know and hear things that are incorrect that you could bring up to say, hey, you know what, I, I think you're looking at that wrong. You know, God didn't make this world broken. You know, he loves you. And it's like, he can, he can fix it. He made it perfect. We botched it. And, but he can, he can fix it again. And he can heal your life if you'll let him in. If you'll just simply follow him, there's a lot more before us than there is behind us. And to give people hope, to guide people around you into the kingdom, and then you will be considered blessed beyond all measure if you can help just save some misconceptions from the people that are around you. And so I just want to encourage you, those who are in the faith, to uh, let's pray that we all become better because the harvest is indeed greater than it has ever been in human history. And may God give us the courage to be able to live up to the opportunity that he has given us. And if you have yet to give your life to the Lord, uh, faith is simple. It's just like simply receiving a gift. It's like saying, Lord, I trust you for my salvation, that you died on the cross to forgive me. And we're told in Romans 10, 9, that if we confess with our mouth uh, that Jesus is Lord and believe that God rose him from the grave, we will be saved. The discipleship part is where it gets a bit tough because, you know, what? this world wants to drag us back to the place where we once came from. And, uh, but with the Holy Spirit's help, he will lead us into all righteousness and lead us in leading his church in this era that we live in now. Well, thank you for coming to church with me online. God bless you. Have a great day. Let's do something together. Life is better in community. So let me encourage you to reach out to us via the connect card that you'll see in the description at the bottom of this video. That's your opportunity to just say hi. Let us know you're watching. Let us know how we can be praying for you. Or maybe you have some questions about faith, about our church, um, or about life in general. We're here to help you and we're happy to do so. I'd also like to thank those who are faithfully giving. I can't express my thanks enough. We're able to continue ministry in our community and abroad um, so wonderfully because of your faithfulness of giving the Lord's tithes and your offerings. So to go above and beyond his tithes is just incredible. And so for those of you who uh, want to come and visit us, please know that our service is a gift to you. We never ask for anything uh, as, from our guests. As a Christian, it is my act of worship to give to the Lord. And each one of us Christians uh, believe that. So if you want to come check us out, there's no pressure. Just come on over. Uh, if you did want to give, we have simple ways. Give at regalchurch.com for your e-transfer, no password required. You can drop it in the offering plate on Sundays, or you can drop through the to the office um, through the week. Pop in, say hello, and uh, let us know who you are, and uh, we'd be happy to chat with you. Uh, we can also set up automatic deposit. We'll just send you the simple form, 
and you fill it out and send it back and it's good to go. So thanks for your time and God bless you. Thank you.